Good afternoon, everyone. I'll call the meeting for the Medical Advisory Subcommittee to order. Just take a quick roll. Dr. Clifton? Here. Meg Delia? Here. Jim Romanoff? Here. Great. Thank you for attending. Welcome back. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Clifton. I think she's got uh, just a quick PowerPoint to bring us up to speed on what we discussed last time. And Meg, I know you, we talked and you uh, circulated that list that we can discuss as well. Um, and Jim also recirculated the 2019 uh, report that he did um, that I'd like to get into. So doctor. Thank you, Tom. I'm happy to share my PowerPoint. It was my impression that I needed to share it with the group ahead of the meeting rather than just sort of, you know, drop it on you here. But it's all the stuff that we've already talked about. And if you're comfortable, I can go ahead. Or if you'd like, I can present it in, yeah, on Thursday. That's fine. That, that, that's fine as well. Um, Is it okay to just go ahead then? I don't know how to, uh, I don't know how to share my uh, screen here with this particular uh, system. I'm better. I, I have a little bit more. Let me um, let me get Nellie in here. There should be a like right by the leave button. There should be a little like box with an up arrow in it. If you don't see that, oh, there you go. I think I think I have it. Okay, perfect. How's this look to you guys? Okay. We can see. Okay, that. I'm just. Okay, I'll just leave it in this format. Just so, well, so that uh, we don't we don't. There's not too many slides here. It's just a quick. Uh, 13 slide deck but oh did we call to order do we have to call to order okay uh, I, I did we took roll oh I, I apologize did everyone get the, the minutes yes yeah. um, any issues or edits with that otherwise I'll make a motion to approve the minutes I'll take a motion uh, I guess I'll set the motion Okay, I think Meg just moved to approve it. Can I just get a second and then we'll move on to the slide? Second. Okay, thank you. Minutes approved. Go ahead, Doctor. All right, thank you. So, just as a quick agenda, you know, uh, we did also have the uh, summarized public comments. Does anybody have any particular comments that they want to share about the public comments? Let me see if I can uh, make mine available here at the bottom. Um, uh, if, but if anybody doesn't have any particular, we can just make a note that we reviewed the public comments. Um, okay, so I'll just ask that uh, whoever's keeping notes that they just make a note that the public comments have been sent to each of the individuals within the committee and that everybody's had opportunity for review. As far as the agenda for today's meeting, I wanted to discuss these recommendations for medical cannabis for symptom uh, relief, uh, specifically breaking it down into laboratory testing, uh, a potential for increasing possession limits and uh, continuing to support home grow as an alternative for the disabled or limited mobility. Um, allowing patients to visit uh, dispensaries uh, without additional fees, allowing medical cannabis patients to move from dispensary to dispensary. And then uh, thinking about streamlining the cannabis card consultations so that they can occur potentially telemedically, removing that uh, need for a, an additional in-person exam or the three-month relationship requirement that currently exists in Vermont. And then expanding acceptable medical conditions to include the commonly uh, uh, prescribed medical conditions of anxiety and insomnia, uh, advertising, reciprocity, and finally the use of excess funding. So uh, just uh, starting at the, at the uh, top, we've reviewed the public uh, comments. The, in terms of laboratory testing, uh, I think the suggestion for the subcommittee um, and the uh, that that would be consistent with standards around the country is uh, performing uh, out, uh, third party laboratory testing through uh, an additional uh, laboratory testing company that is uh, not the company that has manufactured the product just to allow that additional level of oversight to assure that the product is safe uh, uh, free of contaminants and to confirm the potency. 
Um, we could also consider the addition of random sampling by regulators uh, that could be additionally added to assure compliance, but that's not a, uh, a you know not a mandatory thing. These test results should, of course, be made available to the public, and I think that that, in a lot of cases, is already uh, the standard practice where you know people expect to see third-party testing on the products that they're buying. So uh, these batch tests are probably uh, very reasonable and uh, aren't going to represent anything probably much different than what's already being done. Excuse me about this. I didn't. I didn't take this out. I was working on this increased possession limits over the weekend because I didn't really understand possession, or I won't say I don't understand possession, but I didn't really understand exactly how uh, or what other states are doing. Um, and uh, currently, there's a two ounce per 30 day limit, and I'm wondering if maybe I can just. Uh, open whoops sorry open the file that i created on uh, possession and just made a list and if you of course if you guys want me to share this with you uh i can um see yeah i i, I i'm happy to share it with anybody or everybody in the uh in the subcommittee but this is just a list of all the states where cannabis is legal and then what their possession uh what their possession uh limits are and uh, in California, I thought was was is a mature state, and probably has uh, uh, you know uh, has has thought about it maybe and come up with a, a, a good idea that maybe the rest of the country could consider. And in California, you're allowed to possess and transport up to eight ounces, uh, and have also six mature and twelve immature plants. This number of plants and the amount that's possessed varies from state to state. It seems to be related to what people think is either a 30-day or um, or a 70-day or a 60-day amount of uh, medication. And then the plants are a question about uh, you know how 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 much a person can do with their um, home grows. And particularly, somebody had mentioned Maine last week, so. I, uh, so I marked this as, as something that I wanted to look at a little bit closer. The possession is two and a half ounces, six mature plants, 12 immature plants, unlimited seed leaves, and up to eight pounds of dried cannabis, which I assume is uh, for the same reasons that Vermont was talking about potentially having to increase the number of mature and immature plants available for a Vermont home grow because there's potential that a person has a short growing season and that they're going to need to grow enough and store enough that they have it for future use potentially for months and months also when i think about uh, cannabis as medicine my patients routinely go to the pharmacy and get a 90-day supply of their medicine and they, uh, it, it, and that, that's a very commonplace thing. So if we're thinking about possession in terms of a 90-day supply, we should probably look at how much people are using over a 90-day and allow possession to be a 90-day supply would be my first thought. And then expand on what people are doing with their home grows so that their home grows can function properly in a state that has sort of a limited growing season. Uh, Go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. No, thanks, Doctor. Um, Meg sent around um, a document earlier today as well, and I, Meg, I think your suggestion was three plants and three ounces. Did you just want to uh, explain on it for Doctor? Clifton? Sure. We specifically um, asked to increase to three ounces per month. Um, this is just based kind of on anecdotal evidence that we have from the patients. I think two ounces at the uh, current is not enough, um, but overall we had recommended that the patient possession limit uh, align with that of the adult use. So right now if patients are limited to two ounces per month, um, if that is not going to be the case with adult use, we ask that we reconsider that limit. Okay. Okay, I mean, three ounces is probably within the range of what most places in the country are doing. Uh, in terms of the amount that's available at home, 
I'm not sure how we feel about that because, in I mean, if we're just uh, in terms of people using different uh, products, you know, if, if we're, I mean, I feel like a lot of this possession language is sort of deriving from the uh, prohibition language. And if, if we truly don't have a prohibition on cannabis, then I think, you know, I'm able to go down to the wine store and buy a case of wine and add it to the multiple cases of wine I already have stored in my wine cellar if I'm a wine aficionado. And the same would be true of any other hard liquor. So so I don't know that, I don't really understand why we are continuing to impose a limit on the amount uh, that a person can possess before they, before they run into trouble. Dr. Clifton, this is James Pepper. Do you mind if I just weigh in quickly to see, to just well, pro prompt yeah, folks and just... Yeah, have this discussion and flesh this out a little bit. So the, the current, what you're, what's being referred to as a possession limit, um, the, the, thir the 30 days, two ounces, is, is, is a purchase cap. And I think that that just needs to go away, totally. Um, I think that the two ounces is, under our criminal laws, uh, is the amount that triggers a criminal penalty. And I think it's actually mm -hmm. just a civil violation if you have above two ounces. So what I would think is that, um, yeah, it's the, the one-time purchase limit should either track what is, um, what's happening in the adult use, or it could be up to two ounces, or it could be more than that if we make an exception for people in the medical registry on their personal possession limits. But as far as possession limits in your home in a secured lock, locked place, you're actually allowed to possess unlimited amounts of cannabis in your home, even if you're not on the medical registry, because we have home grow, and we don't have a mechanism to determine whether what you have at your house was part of your home grow. So, um, you know, when we talk about possession limits, I think the question should be, get rid of the, the, the cap in a single transaction, or, or pe peg it to what the current criminal law allows you to possess on your person in a single, you okay. know, so either limit it at two ounces, or we should discuss creating kind of a, a 90 day or whatever you thought, you know, if a person, if a patient wants to go, uh, and purchase a 90 day supply that they would have an exemption to the criminal penalties. Um, I think that's where the discussion should go. And then of course, um, if we want to, we could also discuss um, the kind of comparables, like what is, you know, two ounces convert to, a, you know, high THC oil or shatter or something along those lines, if we want to go down that route. Because it sounds like that's kind of a gray area in the current regulations um, for the medical program. Well, there's, okay. So and this does divide up a number of different ways. Purchase cap, different from possession, different from the limit on the number of plants for home grow. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I think I interrupted somebody. I was just gonna, this is Jim, I was just gonna add, you know, my understanding, I think uh, you're right, Pepper, the, the limit uh, is in part because of what you can transport. And I, uh, you know, uh, from a dispensary to your home, and uh, the, the medical patient it is going to be a problem of access. You know, if we're saying uh, you need to make multiple trips, I think for many people it's both, you know, uh, not possible for physical reasons, but also uh, probably not economically possible. The, the plant amount really should just not be, is a separate issue because, uh, you know, of, of what you would purchase at the dispensary. And uh, the oversight board has recommended that we definitely increase the limit uh, to at least have parity with adult use. You know, uh, we've also discussed there's no reason to have, have the limit because of the uh, home possession uh, being unlimited, so. Okay, oh, I see. So really having a plan yeah. It doesn't make sense when your home possession is unlimited. Well, I think that that isn't what I was saying, but I would I would agree that you know I think the plant limits, the reasons for for uh, having them or, or not having them are are multiple. Uh, I think they were just part of the prohibition and the move away from prohibition. There are plenty of ways that a mature plant, uh, you know, you could have all of them die in a week, especially if it's outdoors uh 
you know, so I think that's part of it is being able to hedge your bets or they don't get big enough and don't produce that much. You know, one plant will produce one amount one time and not the next time. So I think that's really separate uh, from the limits uh, in the dispensaries. And Pepper's correct, right now it's a gray area on the concentrates. Uh, it is the way that, you know, if a patient is not using flour, uh, that usually they are able to obtain the product they need because the concentrates are not one for one uh, looked at as uh, the same weight of medical product. So in some states, it's a 90 day supply as deemed uh, appropriate by the, uh, by the pharmacist or by the doctor. So it's a, you know, it's a, a limit of three ounces or a 90 day supply as deemed by the pharmacist or doctor. So that could be something that would help us to manage the concentrates maybe for people who are, who are using the concentrates and we have that gray area there. Okay. I, I would think we could, but you know, the other thing is, is that the concentrates in looking at these weights, when you're not talking about uh, it being prescribed in the same way as a, as a pharmaceutical would be, it's hard to really compare it because again, one strain could have one amount of THC, a homegrown amount could have a totally different amount and the effectiveness of it as with a pharmaceutical can change all, over time. So, you know, there's a lot of question as to whether uh, the healthcare provider, uh, you know, as with a pharmaceutical would have a way to say, you know, if it's working for this patient, they might need more. Uh, but the sort of cut and dry numbers are, they're difficult to uh, tie directly to the, you know, one for one. Yeah, I, I agree with so, you, Jim. I, mean, I, I really did find this very murky and difficult to, uh, to to come to a conclusion that sort of met the needs of the medical patient as 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 much as possible, and follow the guidelines of what other states have in place. Um, it does seem, you know, it, I mean, ho I'm sorry, home grow and possession kind of blur for me and so I so you know thinking about home grow I agree that when you're dealing with plant limits those do seem somewhat arbitrary too because with crop failure or with a short growing season somebody may end up needing 12 plants rather than you know three plants in order to provide themselves the product they're going to need for the entire year so um Okay, good. I'm really, really glad that we had that conversation because that helps me, um, uh, you know, think about how we might uh, prepare, you know, some additional recommendations. Does anybody else have any comments on possession and purchase caps and plant limits? Meg, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this question because to me there's kind of three options, which are one, peg this to whatever adult use purchase limits are, which we don't know yet, uh, peg this to what the criminal penalties are so that no patient who's driving away from a dispensary might get pulled over and have an interaction with a police officer where they have to show their medical card or do something along those lines, or have a greater than two ounce purchase limit and require a tweak to the criminal statutes um, and then uh, potentially have this area where you might have some police enforcement that might lead to kind of, you know, it might lead to just someone being detained or something like that that's a medical patient. Yeah, uh, you know, I think that's something we of course want to avoid at the end of the day. I think um, if we introduce this idea of patients potentially being detained or dealing with law enforcement, it's only a, a bigger barrier to access to the program. Um, so I, I think I would probably lean towards aligning this with adult use um, purely for the simplification of it um, and really making sure that the medical patients are not more restricted than adult use. Uh, I know that's hard to say without knowing what the adult use limits will be. Um, but I would tend to lean towards aligning with adult use limits. 
right. The other thing I saw in a couple of states, uh, Megan, was that uh, patients were required to carry their medical card with them. And that, mm -hmm. I mean, that seems reasonable because we're used yep. to carrying our identification or our driver's license. That doesn't seem particularly onerous on the patient. And that would provide that level of protection if they have, you know, an excess, what would be considered an excessive amount, you know, from a recreational or legal standpoint. Yep. And that's, I think, um, completely reasonable at the dispensaries. The patients are required to show their medical cards every time. Um, so that's definitely not overly burdensome. Okay. All right, wonderful. Does anybody else have any comments? I really appreciated that input, Megan. Thank you. And Jim? Okay. The other, the other uh, modification, the other concept we were thinking about was allowing patients to visit uh, any dispensary uh, uh, for, because right now the, the rule in Vermont is, is that patients have to choose a dispensary and if they go to a different dispensary, they have to pay an additional fee to get access to that dispensary. My thought would be that different dispensaries have different products and if a patient uh, wants to go to a different dispensary or their access to their current dispensary is limited uh, due to, you know, travel to visit somebody else in the state or due to a storm or something, uh, it might be helpful for them to be able to visit, visit dispensary to dispensary. I wonder if maybe part of the reason why a single dispensary is allotted to a single patient is because we don't have adequate patient monitoring systems in place. But I, but I think that those are pretty easy to put in place now, uh, or they're already in place for opioids and controlled substances, and we could kind of, you know, work on that footprint to make sure that somebody isn't taking their prescription to more than one location or getting multiple prescriptions from multiple, you know, doctors and filling them in other places, you know, any types of abuse like that. Does anybody have an opinion on that? Um, I would uh, agree that. Oh. Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say, I would agree that we need to allow patients to visit any medical dispensary. We know that when adult use comes, not only can medical patients go to their medical dispensary, but they can absolutely go to adult use dispensaries as well. Um, so it just, um, it seems honestly quite silly to have some limitation where they could turn around and then just go to a handful of other dispensaries um, and yet be limited from another medical specific dispensary. Yeah, I, I think we're probably all in agreement on this, unless Jim or either Jim had something to say, but I, I think this one's pretty sweet. No, this one's good. Yeah. So we just move on. This one's pretty obvious. Okay, marvelous. I, I agree. The one thing I would say is that, you know, uh, if we are going to be asking the dispensaries to preserve a baseline of products, of medical products, you know, I think that would be the question is whether uh, every dispensary everywhere is making uh, the products that are uh, meet the regulations for medical that are most likely going to be at higher uh, THC caps. So, you know, in theory, I as a patient, I would definitely want to be able to go to any dispensary, uh, but I would imagine it, it's uh, more complicated just in terms of uh, the products themselves. Uh, not every patient's going to want to go and buy the adult use product, it won't, won't be adequate. So that's, it's really not an opposition to it, it's just a, a, a caveat about it. All right. Thank you, Jim. And then this next slide is on exempting cannabis cards from an in-person exam. This is sort of a consolidation of a number of slides where there was a question of exempting PTSD from an additional physical exam uh, or uh, exempting uh, patients from uh, annual uh, exams and for, for their cannabis cards. And my suggestion would be that we uh, that we continue an annual evaluation because really in virtually every circumstance, even in terminal medical conditions, doctors see their patients and follow up because 
new conditions or new medications can be put in place that can be impacted by the current medications. Drug interactions have to be explored. And we're continuing to learn about all of the drug interactions associated with cannabis. So a once a year is really quite a liberal policy already, you know. Uh, a lot of a lot of things we see patients for every three months, like depression and high blood pressure. Uh, but what I thought might be valuable to the patient would be to cap the annual revenue for a doctor to do uh, cards to two hundred and fifty dollars, uh, which appears to be if you're running a a card company and you're paying the additional med mail. I just paid my med mail for to be able to talk about cannabis and to work in cannabis. That cost me six thousand dollars in addition to the other med mail that I'm paying. And I and mine's probably low because I, I I don't have any uh, judgments against me uh, for um, uh, any med mail judgments against me. And so for most doctors at 25 years of practice, that's probably not the case. But the other, the probably the most innovative and patient-focused thing that we can do with examination for cannabis cards is to uh, create a telemedicine system to provide a patient-centered, uh, safe approach where the provider can talk to the patient about their conditions. They can request old records or communicate with other providers as needed, and uh, provide follow-up. Uh, you know, for the year after that card is completed. And the telemedicine examinations are available for cards in the state of New York and in the state of Iowa, and I'm, I'm sure in other states, but I haven't uh, looked it up. And there's really been no, you know, significant risks identified. Uh, you know, the patients uh, uh, get to do it on their time from their own home, and, uh, and, and the doctors are, of course, licensed in Vermont. And, and and have been trained uh, similarly around the country, you know, and have the same licensing procedures around the country, and and of course have their license uh, up, up to date in Vermont, so they could provide the cards. Um, telemedicine is certainly not the uh, controversy that it was two years ago before the pandemic. So, I wonder how people feel about this. I'm yeah. sorry, if you could just clarify this telemedicine system, is this a system employed by the state or I guess I'm a little confused how this, uh, how this, you know, are you allowing their existing physicians to connect via telemedicine or is this an entirely no, new program? Um, well, I don't think this would be managed by the state. It would just be managed, uh, Megan, I think, by different physician groups. There's, you know, uh, uh, marijuanadoctors.com, Lawyer right. Heal, you know, Presto Doc. There's a lot of telemedicine doctor organizations that bring doctors into various states to provide cannabis cards really easily and quickly for patients. But then, you know, doctors right in the state could also do a cannabis card, you know, from their office telemedically. It seems like when patients come to cannabis, they're often not coming to cannabis as their first diagnosis, as their first treatment for their diagnosis. Seizure patients, for example, it is on average the 13th medicine that they're trying for their seizures. So they have a well-established diagnosis of seizure. They've gone through multiple physical examinations. So this uh, this would be the idea that the patient uh, doesn't probably need an additional physical examination to clear them for using medical cannabis. And you can actually do a pretty good physical examination over the phone. Like I can see that all of you are breathing normally. You're not coughing or sneezing. You're sweating. You don't have a tremor. Uh, you know, you're well nourished and well kept. So you can get a, quite a bit of examination done without, you know, without having to put your stethoscope on someone's chest. Sure, Over so this would be in, a, in addition to the option is also seeing your, your healthcare provider that you've been seeing for whatever condition it is. Yeah, I mean, I, yes, yes, that's true. I think the problem is, is that a lot of people don't want to get into cannabis cards again because you know, the med mal, if you start even bringing cannabis up in a conversation, is that additional $6,000 a year. So unless you're really doing cards, 
you it's very hard to like one up a card or do a card for half a dozen people in your practice it just doesn't make financial sense um, and I'm not affiliated with any of these companies I don't have I mean just to be perfectly transparent I don't have any relationship I'm just I just think that as far as patients and patient satisfaction and ease for patients you know you could just do telemedicine from your living room and then still sure. get hard covered but th this is not how our program works in Vermont right this be changing it completely at this point the way it works here is that your doctor is not giving you a card <clears throat> your doctor is not even recommending cannabis for you the doctor is just verifying that you are their patient for X period of time and it's the requirement has been six months and that they are treating you for this condition and they don't have to say the condition they recommend to be treated with cannabis they're just saying you have a condition yeah. and then when you send your form in it qualifies you from the registry so we have asked at the oversight committee that the $50 fee be waived because that's the direct fee that you're paying to get your cannabis card. And once there's an adult use market and taxation, the assumption is that it'll be funded in, in another way. Uh, and the question of the length of time that you need to know your doctor, we wanted those decreased from six months down to three months. And the question of, of PTSD patients was really not related. If that is a question that mostly is relating to the veterans and the VA, there are other people with PTSD that are not veterans that have other uh, backgrounds. But in this case, you know, the VA is not allowed to <laughs> recommend uh, or sign these papers. So it's considered an extra burden to get that patient to go to a different doctor for a relationship for that amount of time. But we would be adding more restriction to the patient than there is uh, now and I don't you know we'd be asking the doctors in Vermont to do uh, something you know that they're not currently doing so I, I didn't imagine at this point we were overhauling uh, yeah. the system now oh, okay we well I didn't access, that. We yeah might. I guess I didn't understand that might be good. I, you know, I would agree with you do. Jim I think we already have so many doctors who are hesitant to even be a verifier, and this um, would present an additional um, kind of intimidating factor potentially. And you know, I do want to just go back a little bit because I know you had mentioned it's it's not necessarily a, a hardship for patients to see their healthcare providers for a chronic illness um, annually, but. I do uh, believe that in 2019 there was support uh, by the Senate. We had asked that that, uh, that requirement be removed for people with chronic illness, um, illness that was not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and terminal illness. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Um, so it's not that they're not checking in with their physicians. I'm sure, you know, if you have chronic illness or a terminal illness that you are absolutely seeing a physician on a regular basis um, but we just ask that they don't need to have an appointment specifically for the verification annually um, yeah. so I, I've got two questions for for Meg and Jim because I, Meg I read your list and I, I read um, 2019 report uh, first I mean, did you guys delve any deeper and did you come up with a definition of, of what chronic um, is or, or, or might be, because that that seems like it might that that could be maybe overly vague um, with respect to some conditions. And then second, on the um, on the consultation time, uh, Jim, you, I saw where, and then you just said I think you you were recommending the three month. Uh, mm -hmm from six to three and then I think Meg you just wanted it eliminated all altogether right yes that's correct it's a, Jim were you in, in line with that or, or? Yeah. yeah well eliminating it all together would absolutely be a, a good idea I mean you know three months in part was uh, to reflect you know the concern for some people who were not in state 
uh, the full year where it was complicated uh, to, you know, have necessarily uh, a, a three-month relationship and be able to address uh, medical concern with cannabis in a timely fashion. So three months or less, absolutely. And, you know, I think uh, your other question... A chronic. Uh, chronic illness. Well, I, you know, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, you guys would do better than me than me, I would. But I believe it's referring back to the list of approved, uh, uh, you know, conditions that are in the law. And of those, uh, you know, what are considered uh, chronic. So I don't, I'm not sure that uh, there was a lot of room for uh, much, you know, mistake because you, you couldn't come in and say, I have, you know, uh, chronic sleeplessness because that was not an approved condition. We'd like that to be approved, but it wasn't. So, and but you, I just want to, I'm sorry, Jim, go. No, go ahead. I just want to be clear. I believe um, it is not six months. It is a three-month relationship with healthcare providers at this point. You know, I love, I love, I have to say, I love this. This is wonderful that, that you guys have a system in place where a patient can just simply go to see a, a, a physician who's comfortable with verifying the physician can charge the patient for a visit that will probably be covered on their insurance. And then, and then they can have the documentation they need to take through the state, and it only costs fifty dollars. That is as inexpensive as it gets, I think, and and as streamlined as it gets. I just want to add that chronic illness, or maybe we could say incurable illness, might be better. Uh, that you have a, a pain that's not going away, or that if you get, for example, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, it's a chronic illness that's not going away. So. Um, so that would also be a, uh, a uh, you know, we could call them terminal, incurable, or chronic illnesses. In medicine, when we consider something chronic, it's generally 12 weeks or more. If we've been working on a pain syndrome, for example, that you've been dealing with for 12 weeks, you're on two medications that we've titrated up and you're not better, that's where we consider it a chronic uh, diagnosis. Excuse me. So we could make chronic illness like a, 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 a diagnosis that's been in place for three months. And I like the idea of discontinuing the three-month relationship because if you have a physician who's comfortable qualifying people, then other physicians in the community can say, you know, I don't want to do this, but Dr. Smith does this, and you can go and see her. And then the patient can make that transition without having that three-month delay. I, I, got a, I got a question. Uh, so this is James Pepper here. I mean, um, I feel like the direction that we need to go in a little bit is giving physicians more autonomy over their patients and not being too heavy-handed. Uh, and I'm wondering if it could be a, no more than once a year, but at the discretion of the doctor. I and mean, if the doctor is saying this is an incurable, in my opinion, this is an incurable, or a chronic illness, I don't ever need to verify this condition again. I know that it's, you're gonna live with this for the rest of your life. And you could just waive this annual verification altogether. Um, and that way we avoid having to define what chronic means. Um, but I, I'm fine with either, honestly, but I do think that Tom's right. That we'll have to, in our rules, define what chronic means because I feel like physicians, especially in this realm, want more, uh, directive than less. Um, I'm happy to send the language from S-117 that yeah. passed the Senate in 2019 as well because that uh, specifically yeah. addressed that and obviously the language is there. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's exactly what Jim and Meg were recommending and also yeah. increase health care provider uh, autonomy, what, which right. also wants uh, Meg, yeah. Meg's correct. I just spoke. We, we, we are down to and we were supporting just eliminating it all together. We went from six to three before. And then, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, absolutely, you know, giving the doctors more autonomy is good, but I'll, I'll say it again. I think the reason chronic is in there is the conditions are so limited right now 
I think the autonomy would really be in broadening the conditions uh, and allowing doctors to say what conditions they felt uh, were appropriate for, for medical cannabis. Because right now, they just have to say, I know you, and the list of the conditions came from the doctors at the legislature. So yeah. uh, that's where we're at now. Yeah, I think we're getting I mean, to the qualifying conditions. I would imagine that's on this list. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I actually was, when you said qualifying conditions, I said, ah, doggone it, I forgot to put my list, of my massive list of qualifying conditions in here that we could, uh, that, that we could go over, but let me so, see, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to um, interject and say that along with uh, the language in S-117 about doing away with the annual visit for chronic conditions, there is also language supporting um, allowing healthcare providers to determine what is or is not a qualifying condition. I know last time there was some question about the legislature's appetite for that, but that was passed by the Senate in 2019. Good, good. And um, doctor, just so you know, we, we've got about four or five minutes before we have to open up for public comment. Okay. Um, um, I, oh, the only thing I have, oh, sorry, have Tom, the only thing comment. I have left is advertising uh, and uh, I, I don't really know what to talk about what about with that other than maybe that should just mirror uh, the alcohol and tobacco regulations. That, that's what the Jim's uh, 2019 report recommended and then Meg also suggested in, in what she circulated that um, it sounded Meg like you were promoting more of it, it's not counter to that but it's more you wanted more freedom to do more educational awareness. I yeah, I think the focus of that is really um, making people aware that we have the program, but specifically educating uh, healthcare providers on the program. Um, and having that come from the state, I think, would be critical because, you know, as much as dispensaries may be able to speak with a doctor who is interested in learning about the program, um, we would like to see some more outreach from the state or at least more educational resources available to them. Um, you know, back to these barriers to access, there are plenty of healthcare providers in the state of Vermont who are not comfortable with being verifiers. Um, so we think that could be critical to at least getting a few more more comfortable. Thanks. That that makes a lot of sense. And there is a, a separate subcommittee, public health, that is focusing on developing the regs for for advertising in a more comprehensive format as well. Yep. And then moving quickly here through these last few slides, the reciprocity, we were thinking about uh, allowing anybody who has a valid medical cannabis card from any other state to allow to be purchased in Vermont's medical dispensaries to support relocation, tourism, uh, or people who have second homes or vacation homes that want to have, you know, uh, both Florida and Vermont. Um, some states have reciprocity with neighboring states. A lot of states don't have reciprocity, but doctors, health providers are certified and licensed and trained very similarly across our country. So reciprocity, reciprocity, excuse me, seems like it might make sense um, from my point of view and make it as easy as possible for patients. Yeah, yeah I would agree. I think reciprocity is critical. Yeah. Okay. And then I think uh, the only, the three month relationship we had already talked about it. I'm not really sure what to do with uh, excess funding. Um, uh, so I, I think that's probably a broader uh, discussion that we probably don't have time to do in less than one minute. <laughs> so Dr. Clifton. <laughs> we got a long way today, I appreciate this. Dr. Clifton, we don't have any public comment in the room. I just did a quick poll. Um, I did. I did have a question about reciprocity um, because, of, of course, you know, other states, Maine, um, their uh, their qualifying conditions list is essentially whatever a doctor thinks should be a qualifying condition. And I'm wondering if this puts Vermonters at a disadvantage when they can't access a, a dispensary when had they lived somewhere else and got their card somewhere else, they would be able to. It, it it puts us at a disadvantage because uh, the we were able to use our card already in other states. Right. Uh, and the disadvantage is here that that a lot of the you know uh, Vermonters that yeah I, I guess I'm agreeing with you. I mean the, the current patients 
uh, aren't effective as much as the potential for new patients. And uh, I think part of the reason for reciprocity is, you know, to support the business of uh, the medical program uh, that, you know, the, the, the products themselves and, and creation of them and stocking of them uh, will have more economic stability and strength that there's a greater customer base, uh, you know, allowed to come and purchase. I think to me the question is that it, the disadvantage is kind of if you you have a condition uh, that you qualified for from out of state, uh, somebody might not qualify here, you're correct, to come and use the dispensary, but uh, I'm not sure that that is a, so much of a, of a disadvantage that I it, take it away. Yeah, it doesn't worry me. I was just flagging it. it is, are we going to are we going to limit the people that have the qualifying conditions in Vermont? You know, if you're um, if you're from New Hampshire and you have you know terminal cancer, then sure you can come use ours. But if you have anxiety or acute pain, the two that kind of have been the historically the political footballs on qualifying conditions, can you come to? Vermont and use your medical card here. I, it's just a question. I, 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 it seemed like we went pretty quickly on reciprocity, and I just wanted to dig into that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to also share with you guys from my, uh, I, I do this stopping the top killers with cannabis is the talk that I do when I'm uh, running around. I spoke at MECAN in Boston last weekend, and I'll be in, uh, I get to speak also in New Jersey in a couple of weeks and then in Chicago at the end of October, but I just created this list quickly uh, thinking about all of the different things that um, cannabis can treat. And there's, a, you know, there's there's just such a, uh, such a broad number. I'll go ahead and enlarge that a little bit for the purposes of our call, but there's, um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of things on here that really respond beautifully to cannabis, a lot of them that fall under chronic pain. But, you know, ADHD, autism is getting looked at closely. Um, and a lot of skin conditions that could be considered a good reason to uh, allow somebody to use cannabis. So there's room for expansion on these diagnoses, but I don't, uh, I'm not sure how we would proceed with that. Yeah. You know, with such an inclusive list of potential qualifying conditions, I. I'm still, um, I'm still in support of allowing physicians to determine what is a qualifying condition. You know, looking at this list, it yeah. sounds like you could really, um, you know, if a, if a patient comes to you and says, okay, this is, I'm having XYZ problem, it sounds like it will likely fit within this list in some sense. Um, and so why not then? Meg, rather that, than having this expansive list. Does that, does that, again, fundamentally change the nature of the program, which, believe me, like uh, I think it's time for a refresh, but does that go beyond uh, a doctor verifying that you have one of these conditions to a doctor recommending that you use cannabis to treat it? In that sense, I would say it will change. Um, Jim, you look like <laughs> You know, no, I'm, a, I'm agreeing. I mean, it's one of these things where it's an unspoken right now. You know, we have we've gone so far in Vermont to allow the doctor to not have to say they recommend cannabis that uh, you know we forget that my healthcare provider, in a discussion with me, agreed that it would be a good idea. Uh, you know, and then signed all the papers that we had this relationship and what the conditions that I had were. But, uh, you know, I think that the idea, I think Chairman Pepper is correct, we're due for a major refresh because our law, uh, you know, does, with all due respect to the legislature, has our legislature acting as doctors at this point and deciding what conditions are appropriate. And I, I am not a, a lobbyist or a political strategist, but I would imagine going to the legislature one at a time to try to approve conditions that are acceptable is going to be like uh, pulling teeth and go legislative session after session after session and not serve 
anybody, especially the patient, very well. Whereas once there's an adult use market, you know, I think a different argument can be made uh, that you know the conditions can be broadened. But we also do have to have a medical community that is on board with it, or at least laws that are flexible enough to you know let the the medical practitioner, the healthcare practitioner. Uh, you know, know that they are considering, <laughs> and it's okay to consider what to recommend for their patient. I mean, I think at this point, we will have to engage the medical community and not just keep saying, if you're not comfortable with it, you know, right. science will be done now as the laws change. So that's the only reason I'm, I'm sort of, you know, smiling and shrugging my shoulders. I agree, we need a, a big change, but we've been had a hard time getting the legislature to change uh, much of anything uh, very quickly. So, you know, I would think just trying to get them to broaden it to the to the point where uh, adding a doctor to the side right now seems like a very minimal thing to do and no harm to anybody because if the doctor doesn't want to do it, they're not going to do it still. And the, right. the law will work the way it used to do. But if they can do it, it would make a huge difference. Yeah, and, and to your point, I mean, I think we saw that um, you know, we've seen how difficult it is to add qualifying conditions, and yet there was support two years ago in the Senate to allow HCPs to determine uh, qualifying conditions. So I, I do think it changes slightly the nature of the program, but at the end of the day, the physician is still verifying that the patient has a condition that could benefit from cannabis. Okay, so great discussion I, i'm just not sure what direction we're going on the list of qualifying conditions i think it would be a good idea to propose that they add the ability of the doctor strengthen what the senate already approved and let's hope that the house and in conference it would it would get passed at this point uh, okay you know I, I think that would benefit everybody and be a certainly a stopgap uh, to, you know, considering more of an overhaul as the medical community grows with the changes in the laws and the availability of double blind peer reviewed studies. I like the idea of having a physician override that the physician can say this patient, you know, for whatever reason is deemed the reason that the, that the patient can go ahead then. Okay. Well, everyone, I think that that may be, is that, oh, no, wait, reciprocity. We already talked about removing that three-month relationship hurdle. And then funding. But, yeah. oh, boy, I don't know how it's up. You know, and, and I've got, I just have three more things on my list, uh, Meg, based on what you had circulated. Two mm -hmm. of them are kind of, I think we've got to deal with, with health and safety issues, uh, but it's the fingerprinting uh, for caregivers, mm -hmm. uh, buffers and the buffer zones are the two health and safety issues. And then there's a question on the limits for how many can be served in a dispensary at a time. I think it's three right now. That'll yep. all be. Imagine that's going to increase anyway. Um, okay. With with adult use, but yeah, maybe for next time we could put that at the top of the list. Uh, Great. Just to discuss fingerprinting for caregivers, doctor, and buffer zones. Okay. And that was that was from Meg's suggestion list that she circulated. There had also been from uh, the the oversight committee lots of question and debate about the number of patients a caregiver can work with. Right. And uh, you know having that number increased just to reflect the fact that every patient is is different. There seemed to be a lot of confusion about the question of a caregiver as a grower, which I think really should be a separate issue, but uh, yeah. I'm really speaking about, you know, a caregiver. Right now we do have uh, uh, pretty substantial limitations and uh, not a lot of good reason to not allow a caregiver to have more patients based on the type of patient. 
Yeah, I would have to say that I feel like the caregiver limits are are um, pretty punitive, I, and I don't really understand them. I mean, doctors, of course, have limits to the number of people they can see, but you know, I think our limit might be 30 a day or 32 a day before you start to, uh, you know, draw attention to yourself from regulators who monitor things like this. So 15 patients for one caregiver seems really low. Well, is that, is that yeah, and the doctor, yeah. It's, it's lower than that. Yes. No. Yeah. I don't know what Vermont's rules are, but the caregivers seem to vary from state to state also. One. One. Oh, one. Oh, one. Yeah. Well. It makes, it, it, and a lot of it is, again, it's about possession and questions under uh, the period governed by the coal, you know, or advised by the coal memo of, you know, what uh, a caregiver was going to be able to go and pick up medical cannabis and have it in your possession and I think the intention Chris, I'm is guessing by the legislature was to limit the, the number of hands that a product has to build but it seems irrelevant it Sorry. seems counterproductive in any medical setting and unrealistic if people would have multiple caregivers uh, in many situations and it just seems as an adult use market really yep. I, I, I've got to jump to the next subcommittee meeting, um, but th there was also, uh, I don't know if this is a suggestion, but but an option, um, I mean, think about whether or not uh, we're okay meeting, we haven't done it yet, but, but two times a week, um, and we're scheduled for Mondays and Thursdays, or if you'd like to do that uh, once a week with, you know, continued phone calls, individual phone calls um, throughout the week, what works better for your schedule, uh, assuming you know we can keep the productivity arc going the, the way we have, but um, it seems like we're making some good progress, so you can think about that as well. Okay, well we'll circle back the next time, I mean I think it would, might be a good idea to work this Thursday together. I and agree. then see where yeah. we're at, and then maybe go to weekly. We'll work on fingerprinting, buffer zones, and then this possession purchase cap concept a little bit more. And we should have this pretty well fleshed out, I think. Thanks so I much. I really appreciate everybody's hard work and attention. All right. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone.